Okay. Uh, okay, recording is in progress. Uh, 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 is audience allowed now? Yes. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, 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 Chancellor Tong, why don't you wait just a minute? Okay. Um, uh, the participants number is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah. it'll, it'll go up as they come in. Uh, okay. when it stabilizes, then it's a good time to start. So it's, uh, yeah, okay. It's, uh, yeah, 34. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the audience would not be very light because uh, uh, we uh, said that uh, uh, there will be no uh, simultaneous translation. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Probably all of us can speak Chinese, right? Not I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why don't we get started and then okay. others will. Uh, uh, Jane, Jane, you want to say something? No, sorry, I hit the oh, okay. button. Sorry about that. Okay, let's start. On the February uh, 28th, uh, the joint communique between China and the USA was issued in Shanghai, starting a process in which universities of both countries played a special role. As a university uh, made possible by the process uh, started 50 years ago, Shanghai and New York University, or NY Shanghai, together with its sponsor on the Chinese side, that is East China Normal University, decided to, early this year to host the three webinars uh, to get, all together uh, this uh, semester, featuring uh, those who participated in Sino-USA exchanges of higher education in the last half a century, respectively as leaders, as students, and as scholars. After the first webinar one month ago, we are now uh, holding the second one. We are so pleased to be able to invite four prominent, prominent panelists from uh, the US and China who studied abroad in the, in the other country and went on to become leaders uh, in the business world and the civil society. Uh, let me introduce uh, these uh, uh, prominent uh, panelists. Dan Brindle, uh, president of uh, Novart, this group, China, previously serving as vice president of Glaxo Smith Klein in Singapore, then uh, Brindle uh, studied abroad in China at the uh, John Hopkins, uh, uh, the Hopkins Nanjing Center. Ge Feng, founding CEO of Jiahui Health System, also serving as uh, 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 CEO uh, of uh, WeWork China. Uh, he uh, studied abroad in the US and the Duke uh, University. Sun Jie or Jensen, uh, CEO of Tripcom Group, uh, previously served as a CFO of uh, C Trip, uh, that is, uh, you know, currently Tripcom uh, 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 Group. She uh, studied abroad in the US at the, the University of uh, Florida. And then uh, Travis uh, Tanner, or Tan Junhui, senior vice uh, president of a Greenpoint Group, previously serving as a president of US China Strong uh, Foundation. Uh, Mr. Travis uh, uh, Tanner uh, studied abroad in China at the Hopkins Nanjing Center as well. This panel will be moderated by uh, Jeffrey Mann, uh, Vice Chancellor of NY Shanghai, previously serving as a president of Cornell University 
uh, Jeff studied abroad in France at the University of Paris uh, 7. Now the floor is yours, Jeff, please. Thank you, Chancellor Tong, and uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, during the past month, uh, I've had the chance to see uh, a lot of events, some in person, mostly online, uh, celebrating the importance of the Shanghai communique. Over and over again, uh, I heard speakers say that no social institution has proven more important than the university to the China-US renormalization process that followed the Shanghai communique. Uh, at one event, I heard a fascinating story from Jan Barris, uh, who was part of the discussions at the end of 1978 that paved the way to the joint communique establishing official relations between the US and China. In this uh, talk, Jan said that in November 1978, uh, the American negotiators were talking among themselves uh, about how during the early 1900s, the so-called boxer indemnity uh, students had strengthened US-China ties. And the Americans decided that they wanted to explore the idea of renewing student exchange beginning in 1979. And so with the approval of President Carter, they proposed very nervously that 10 students might go in each direction every year. Uh, well, as it happened, Deng Xiaoping was expecting this proposal, and he immediately told his negotiators to ask whether the US would accept 5,000 students. Um, well, the American negotiator uh, called Washington DC to get President Jimmy Carter's response. Um, now it was three o'clock in the morning in Washington DC, so they had to wake President Carter up and rather groggily, he replied, tell them to send 100,000. Um, and in fact, during the next four decades, more than 1 million students came from China uh, to study at American uh, universities. So let me show you this slide here. So, so this graph uh, shows how it played out using data from the Institute for International Education. Um, the blue line is students going from China to the United States. Uh, the green line is students going from the US to China. Um, the scale of the two lines is different uh, since China is about five times the size of the US. Uh, the scale of the blue line goes from zero to 400,000 students and the scale of the green line goes from zero to 80,000 students. So the 1980s and 1990s, if you're looking at uh, students going from China to the US, you could call that a period of early exploration um, when the number of Chinese students in the US went from only about 1,000 per year up to about 50,000 per year. In the 2000s, the number almost tripled, rising to about 130,000. Uh, by 2010. And then in the 20 teens, it tripled again, uh, rising to almost 400,000. Um, if you look in the opposite direction from the US to China, the pattern was similar up until uh, the 20 teens, up until 2010. Um, there were a few early explorers in the 1980s and 90s. During the 2000s, it went from about 3,000 each year up to around 14,000. But then during the 20 teens, instead of it continuing at that pace, the level of study abroad from the US to China plateaued. Well, what really matters, of course, is not so much the number of students who moved as it is how the movement affected each student's life. And that is uh, why we are so very fortunate to have these distinguished panelists with us to share a little bit about their own experiences crossing the Pacific uh, to study. So let's begin. Um, when the four of you traveled to study away, it was a time before social media, a time when people in each country had much less exposure to what life in the country was like, in the other country was like um, than they do today. So I'd like to begin by asking each of you if you could just in three or four minutes 
describe what surprised you the most uh, about the other country when you arrived there to study? What, what aspect of the other country do you wish you'd been better prepared for? Um, so Dan, why don't, why don't we start with you? Sure enough. Uh, first of all, thank you to Chancellor Tong and, and to you, Jeff, uh, for thinking to include me in the panel. Um, the topic actually uh, was an opportunity for me to kind of take a bit of a trip down memory lane, if you will. Um, this morning, as I was kind of thinking about the, the topics, I, I was trying to recollect uh, how I felt and what surprised me. And, and I couldn't really, it was so long ago that I nothing really came to mind. And I looked on my bookshelf and found that my, my journals from the time were still there. And I started reading through it. And it was actually kind of interesting to to have some of that come back. So this has been an interesting personal experience for me. Thank you. So I first came to China in my junior year of undergraduate school. The date was October 29th, 1987. Uh, I remember that explicitly. Uh, the China portion of the trip was part of a year long study abroad that I was doing in Asia. We were studying different things in nine Asian countries. Um, we were here initially for two months and I was studying art history in Beijing, Chengdu, and Kunming. And then later in the year, that May of the, the following year, we actually came back overland from Pakistan into Kashgar and made our way on the Silk Road all the way back to Hong Kong. So it was quite fascinating. Um, I came back as a graduate student in 1992 and 93 uh, at the Hopkins Nanjing Center. Um, at the time, my Chinese obviously was better, um, and having the language allowed me to, to have a deeper understanding and appreciation of the country and the culture. But if I think back to China in 1987, what surprised me the most was how contrary everything was to what I thought it would be. So remember the, the context of the time, growing up in the USA, um, the Cold War between the US and Russia was still in play. Um, and there are a lot of stereotypes, I have to say, in the U.S. about communist countries. I remember on the plane um, from Tokyo recalling being nervous about the immigration forms because I was, I was thinking that if somehow we got something wrong on the immigration forms that maybe we could be detained or, you know, something, would, something bad would happen. Um, sorry, my, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we arrived in Beijing. It was midnight. Um, they whisked us through customs and immigration. Nobody stamped our passports, never even took the forms. That really surprised me because I thought, oh my God, this is going to be, you know, very, very uh, administratively burdensome. It was, it was the easiest thing I'd ever experienced. And then we got out into the waiting hall and I was looking at the departure signs. And, you know, like any other airport, you're seeing things like Bangkok, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Osaka. And then I saw Pyongyang. And I thought, oh my God, I've never, never even thought that you could fly to North Korea. And suddenly I'm, I, so I, I realized, wow, um, I could go on and on. And I guess, but to summarize, uh, the thing that I found is that we're raised with a lot of inherent bias. And I actually think that this was kind of an inner wake up call for me, that China was so different from what I thought it would be um, and actually led to a lifelong passion and love for this country. So. The first thing would be first impressions can change your life. Um, the other thing that you, you had asked about is, you know, what should I have been better prepared for? My answer may surprise you, nothing really. Um, and the real joy for me in all of my educational experiences in China has been the journey itself. So my way of thinking, if I was better prepared, I might not have embellished the opportunity or the experience as much as I did. So all in all, I guess spontaneity and serendipity has worked to my advantage. And I guess if I, if I just made a last point, you know, the time in China in 1987 and 88 really kind of tipped my, my passion for China. It made me want to develop my language skills, which ended up wanting to pursue a career in this country. And, you know, fortunately that's brought me to where I am today. So I don't know if that helps. That's great. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Jane, how about you? Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I would like to share my personal experience with the audience. Uh, I did it last time when I came to NYU Shanghai campus. Um, I was very fortunate uh, when I was studying in the law school of Peking University. One of the professors from uh, University of Florida came to my school 
and he wanted to select one student to go abroad and study in the USA. And I was very blessed for the opportunity. Uh, but at that time, uh, as Jeff said, uh, China just opened up. And my parents were both chemistry engineers. Uh, they made decent living in China, which is 100 RMB per person per month. But when you convert uh, these money into US dollars, it is $15 per person per month. Uh, so I had to work two jobs to support myself. But my professor's family were very, very kind to me. They uh, took me in and treated me as their own child. So as a Chinese girl who was highly influenced by Confucian's teaching, I told them that in China, when a kid is young, parents always take good care of their children. But when their parents are older, good children will always take good care of their parents. So I told my professor and his wife that when I grew up, when I'm able to, I want to take good care of you. And they said, oh, honey, you don't need to take care of us. But instead, if you can help the international students in the same way as we help you, we will be very happy. And I was very, very touched because I had no blood relationship with them at all. Yet uh, through them, I see how big hearts they are. So although I was penniless uh, when I was a student uh, in the United States after I did my tuition, I always, always had a very big dream that someday, uh, if I'm able to, I want to establish a scholarship named after my professor to help the international students. Um, and I was very glad in 2016, I went back to my university and established a scholarship named after my professor. Uh, so I think I echo uh, with uh, Dan, not until you go to these countries and see people's life and hear what they say, um, they're very similar to uh, what we have experienced in China with loving hearts, uh, very helpful uh, to the young students, uh, in being very inspiring. Uh, so I uh, was very impressed by the big hearts my host family, my professor's family have showed me and it changed my life. Thank you, thank you, Jane. Uh, Feng, how about you? You're on mute, Feng. Feng. Um, yeah, yeah, so first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Chancellor Tong and Jeff, uh, Jeff for this opportunity. And, and I echo what Dan and, and Jane just said. You know, like Jane, you know, my, my background is very similar to hers. Um, uh, I went to the U.S. in 1998 um, and on a full scholarship. Um, and I think the most surprising thing to me is, of course, uh, I would say two things. Number one, you know, I landed in Durham, North Carolina. And, uh, you know, what surprised me the first is how many trees and how few people, you know, are there, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's quite stunning for someone, um, you know, come from, from, uh, from China. The second thing I would uh, echo what uh, Jane said is really people's friendliness. You know, people are so very much friendly on an individual level. Um, it was just quite eye-opening experience. And, and I also would say, uh, just like Dan said, if you ask me um, what could be better, I think they actually done a great job, you know, in hindsight, uh, they have international group. You know, we have the Chinese Student Association, you know, they send people to pick you up. They set up an international host. Um, uh, the, you know, of course, uh, you know, this is a, if, a minor point, uh, um, you know, I guess for Durham, um, for, for Duke at that time, you know, the, 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 the security there is not that good, right? So the first night I remember, I walked through Duke Forest um, from my uh, um, campus house, right? People look at me and say, where you came from? I said, I came from the Duke Forest. They said, don't ever walk there. <laughs> I said, why? You know, they said, no, you can get robbed. If you need, you, you have to call a cop to ask for you um, going through there. You know, you know, of course, I, I never, I was fortunate enough, never had any um, bad experience personally there. But, uh, but, you know, I had a roommate being robbed, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, that's something that, um, 
uh, other than that, um, I, I would say, um, you know, I particularly, I guess, um, you know, nowadays, if some parents may be worried about that, um, you know, particularly if you come from Shanghai or somewhere, uh, that's something that I would uh, I would uh, advise some of the uh, the universities can can help a little bit. But uh, but in general, though, I would completely agree with Dan. There's nothing you can really prepare uh, when you're going to some country as big as China, as big as the U.S. You have to uh, enjoy it, uh, experience. I mean, that's by itself is the is the whole is the whole thing. So. So um, like Jane, you know, I, 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 I'm very grateful for, for my experience um, in the US. Um, and, and it also made me um, more appreciative of the, the, the Chinese heritage. You know, uh, in China, we say no contrast, no difference, right? Um, certainly that, that contrast make you appreciate both sides. Thank you, Feng, thank you. And, and Travis, over to you. Super, yeah, and thank you again, um, Chancellor Tong and Jeff for this opportunity. It's great to be with you all today. Um, so I think about what surprised me most, um, I would say number one, that China would become a fascination and then dictate the following going on 24 years of my life. And now the lives of my wife and my four children um, who've now lived in Beijing, that was not expected. In 1998, when I first came to China uh, on my way, you know, landed in Guangzhou, China. I, I studied at the Jinan University, I was there to study Chinese for one year, period. Looking for adventure, looking for something, a new experience. And now one year has turned into 24 years. And, and now the focus of, you know, my life and my, my profession and, and my family's life. So I really did catch the China bug um, and have thoroughly enjoyed living in three of the Kind of mega regions of China. So lived in the Pearl River Delta and then Nanjing uh, for a short time and now here in Beijing and, uh, and, and, and here with my four children, we've just had such a wonderful adventure and experience. Now on a serious note, what's, what surprised me when I think about that question, when I came to China, what would I have appreciated understanding better? Two, two quick observations. One, the diversity of China. The diversity, the diversity of opinions, the diversity of lifestyles, the diversity of viewpoints, customs, language, of course, food. Um, diversity was not a common word that I had heard used to describe China before I came here. Um, very much more like homogeneous was a word I think I would have associated uh, more commonly. But Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, very different cities, right? Rural China versus urban China, very different places in so many ways. So diversity. And then second, um, Wish, what I didn't appreciate, what I would have wished I would have known a little more is how to, the sensitivity to the unique and nuanced communication styles used in China. One, inter, one interacts or encounters lots of very indirect and very unique um, communication styles in China. Now, I don't like to use stereotypes or generalizations, but to make a point, I'm going to. Um, I heard a businessman once uh, sum up what he learned by doing business and living in China for many years in the following terms. He said, when you hear, quote, unquote, you don't know China, that means the counterpart disagrees with you. Quote, unquote, new regulation means they found a new way to avoid doing something. Quote, internal regulation, unquote, means they're mad at you. Quote, basically, no problem means a very big problem. I said, and everything you hear in China is true, but often conflicting and frequently unreliable. And finally, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. In China, there are no straight lines. So again, very much a generalization, but I think highlights the importance of a very nuanced and very unique communication style one encounters here. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, so for this next question, uh, I'm wondering if each of you uh, could share for our audience, what about the experience of studying overseas do you think has most helped you in your career after graduation? Jane, why don't we start with you? Yes, um, when I went to the school, uh, the thing that uh, really impressed me is how free students are, uh, because the, in the way uh, I was brought up in Peking University, it is considered a very liberal university, but yet uh, 
teachers have a lot of authority. We are not supposed to chew gums uh, in the classroom or put our feet on the desk when we listen to our professors. Um, but when we in, uh, in the USA, I think uh, the professors are very good with introducing different ideas uh, and have the students really think out of box. And later on, when I went to the Silicon Valley, I was very impressed by how vibrant uh, Silicon Valley is, how attractive the Valley is for many top talents, uh, such as uh, uh, Steve Jobs, now Elon Musk, et cetera. Uh, so the ability for students to go out of the box, think creatively, uh, challenge the status quo, uh, it's very helpful later on when we develop our career uh, in the Silicon Valley and then back into China. So, so uh, learning how to feel comfortable challenging the status quo is mm -hmm. part of what uh, helped you to uh, become an innovator uh, in, in your own work. Um, great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, Travis, uh, how about you? What, what sort of instrumental value can you point to from the experience? That's a great question. Um, two quick uh, notes I'll share. One, I think a broadening of my perspective or viewpoint uh, through really meaningful experiences, right? Gaining a fresh perspective. There's nothing as healthy as re-examining your own convictions and previously held conceptions. And that's what studying abroad makes you do. Um, I think everyone's familiar with the, the Chinese idiom, jing di zhi wa. Right, the frog sitting down at the bottom of a well can only see right what he can see in that well. You can't talk to that frog about the ocean because he only knows that little pool of water that he's lived in his whole life. So broadening one's perspective, I think, is very valuable to be a successful professional. And then second, I think um, I would say I, studying abroad in China gave me lots and lots of practice at getting outside of my comfort zone, right? I don't think studying abroad is in and of itself a magic pill, right? If I study abroad, I'll get lots of valuable experience and insights. It's about leveraging that opportunity to create meaningful experiences, right? Lots of students study abroad in one or the other countries and can just scroll on their, on their phone and stay in their dorm room and not go out and experience the environment they're in. And they won't get the same experience as someone who steps out of their comfort zone. A uh, quick personal example, when I was a student at the Hopkins Nanjing, spirit, or Hopkins Nanjing Center, um, the director came to the student body and said, hey, we, we have an opportunity to host a, a delegation of American congressmen who are coming to China, and they're going to come spend a day in Nanjing. And if you'd like to, we're going to let you all compete to get to be basically a tour guide and show your congressman what you want them to know about China. You have a day to do that. So you had to work a Chinese and an American student together to design an itinerary, and then those itineraries were judged and then ultimately selected. So me and a Chinese friend, we spent literally days and days preparing our itinerary. And in the end, we were selected to lead a group and we hosted a congressman and his wife and a couple of other VIPs. And we spent some time at Nanjing University with some engineering students. We went out to a farm in the, on a small island in the middle of the Yangtze River where they grew chives and had grape orchards. We had lunch with a farmer. We went to a school for blind children. Uh, we met at a, re at a Chinese retirement center and this congressman got to learn how the social, uh, credit or the social system worked here. And that experience made me get out of my comfort zone over and over and over again to figure out how to pull together something like that. And now that, that particular call or a classmate, he and I to this day are very dear friends. Our families are dear friends. Um, and it's all because of that experience um, as a study abroad student. So getting outside your comfort zone and uh, having a broadening of your own perspective. Terrific, terrific, Tra Travis. Uh, before we go on, let me just say to the audience, um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll see a Q&A button. Uh, later on, uh, we'll have some time uh, for questions uh, from the audience. And so if you have a question for any of the participants or all of them, uh, please don't hesitate to click on that Q&A button. Um, Dan, uh, uh, over to you. What about the experience of studying overseas has been helpful to you in your career uh, after graduation? Sure. Um, we could probably spend a whole day and probably several bottles of wine one evening talking about this. Um, a lot of what Travis and, and Jane just shared resonates with me um, completely. 
maybe in the interest of time, just make a, a couple of observations, I guess. For me, I, I really did, as, as I told you before, two separate stints um, overseas. And each of them, in a way, kind of had a, a different impact on, on my future, I think. So as an undergraduate student, um, it was obviously a remarkable opportunity. You know, we traveled across nine countries in Asia for, for a whole year and experienced it a lot, um, tons. But I think most importantly, it afforded me the opportunity to understand myself better, um, challenge my beliefs and my thinking, and maybe to open my mind to some things that were not necessarily obvious to me before I embarked on the journey. Uh, interestingly, it's, it's, it's really a huge benefit in how I later on approach things in life. Um, and even today, um, in, even in my capacity at Novartis, um, I recall walking with a friend in a small alley in uh, Varanasi, India. Um, it's in the north of India. It was March of 1988. And the two of us were talking about, you know, whether this long journey had, whether we had changed at all throughout this journey. And uh, as we strolled through this, this really small alley, you know, it was try to try to give you a little bit of conduct context. There was cow dung everywhere. Um, you're navigating through people and they're selling everything and it's just chaotic. And you've got cows and stray dogs all over the place. And uh, he suddenly looked at me and he goes, you know what? I think it has changed us. And I kind of looked at him and said, how? And he said, well, he goes six months ago, there's no way in hell we would have been caught dead in a small alley like this. And right now it doesn't even phase us. And, you know, as I thought about that, he was right. The experience deepens your confidence and it becomes part of who you are. It's part of your DNA. And then if I was to kind of fast forward to uh, the Hopkins Nanjing experience, um, that was also a, a, a very unique opportunity for me that changed my life. Um, certainly it allowed me to focus on my, my language capabilities, um, deepen my understanding of Chinese politics, culture, society, and certainly made me unique and able to be having a career involving China. I remember, and Jeff, don't, don't take what I'm going to say next offensively, <laughs> but I remember having a, a conversation with my dad and uh, kind of looked at me and he said, son, what do you plan on doing with all this Chinese language and, and uh, focus on China and Chinese. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to integrate my love for China with uh, my passion for the law. And, uh, you know, he looked at me and he said, China doesn't have law. So you're going to be a law professor. <laughs> and I kind of looked at him and laughed and I said, well, one day it'll have law and maybe I can play a role in making it stronger. And, you know, funny enough, that's kind of how my career has evolved. And I've, I've had an absolute ball with it. And I, I, have zero regrets about the path that, un, you know, the path that unfolded in front of me. And I've been, I've been blessed by a great number of people that have kind of touched my experiences along the way and helped me out. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm convinced none of this would have ever happened had I, had I not gone overseas. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Fung, over to you. Sure. You know, I think uh, all the uh, panelists have uh, talked about, I think, uh, you know, studying abroad, um, as all of them said, is, is the exposure is, is by itself, right? It's everything. Um, you know, I, I personally believe in diversity. Um, you know, work, uh, when I first uh, went to the U.S., it was the first time um, I flew, you know, I mean, the first time I ever took, uh, uh, take an overseas trip. You know, it's not just a choice, it's, it's more, more of a privilege, right? I mean, I think that's something that I always trying to remind myself. You know, even look at your charts. Yes, there's 1 million Chinese students going to the US, all that, but it's still a small um, minority. Um, and, and, you know, when I was at, uh, my, at Duke, you know, I, I shared a room with a, a, a German, you know, a South African, you know, and, and you know, we had a great time. Um, you know, that's also a big part, not just the, um, like Jane said, the difference in educational method. And that's certainly very, very helpful. Um, you know, I certainly, you know, I have two majors. One is uh, 
in economics. I had no clue about economics uh, when I finished my undergrad, you know. <laughs> so, so, so I took a couple of classes. It's really reignited my uh, interest uh, in, this, in this business because listening to the, the professor uh, taught differently. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would still encourage um, uh, to all the people, you know, today, whether in China and, and, and in the U.S., now certainly to many people, I like Jane and myself, uh, you know, 20 years ago is much more constrained, right, economically and, and by choice. But uh, if you have the chance, not just China, if you can, or the U.S., um, if you can have opportunity to study anywhere, um, or, or travel to anywhere that would be um, fantastic, you know. So, so I think uh, um, in, in today's world, uh, we all talk about separation, you know, isolation. I, 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 I would say um, diversity is good, more exposure is good, and make us stronger um, individually and, and uh, as mankind. So thank you, Fung. If I could actually just uh, follow up a little bit on on this point, because I think um, you you just touched on something that that I do hear uh, a lot when I'm talking to families. Um, people are nervous. They say there's all this uh, impulse to decouple. Um, they read about uh, about uh, anti Asian hate in the United States or things like that. And I, I, I do get questions about whether um, the benefits today uh, for Chinese young people of studying in the US or conversely, I hear it when I talk to Americans, whether the benefits for Americans of studying in China are, are worth the risks. And what you just said seemed to suggest you, you think they still are. Um, but I, I, I'm curious if you have any guidance to offer uh, these parents uh, as they're trying to do this kind of balancing. Yeah, you know, as I said, uh, I, I would agree with it. Just uh, Dan just said in the beginning, you know, we tend to have a very different perception of risk um, and, and we tend to overestimate those. Um, and as I acknowledge, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, I'm a parent, I, I have three young kids. You know, if you ask me, uh, uh, I would say, you know, I, I would worry about, I wouldn't worry about the political security. I would more worry about um, the, uh, you know, some like in China, I would say crime is something that, you know, uh, uh, from a US high education point of view, I think that's something that worthwhile dealing with. Um, now, the second thing is when you talk about anti-Asia and all of that, you know, um, you know, my wife grew up in the U.S. You know, we all Chinese by heritage. We talk about this, you know. Um, you know, we all have to realize, you know, you have to accept people are a diverse bunch. You know, there's good ones, a majority of them are good, and there's always going to be a um, bad one, just in Ch whether in China or in the U.S. Uh, let's not take a, uh, you know, very rigid view about that. And that's life, right? You know, um, you know, as a parent, Forget about my me, you know, I, I think I, I would firmly believe um, let them be exposed to um, different things is a good thing um, because life is not about monotone. Uh, uh, life is not about, you know, a straight line, like, a, <laughs> like a Travis said, you know, two points. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, having that choice by itself implies a, a privilege, you know, um, um, you know, people forgot about that. You know, in China, I mean, I think Jane would know this uh, uh, better than any of us. Uh, uh, you know, Chinese are so big of uh, uh, traveling until the pandemic, but it's still a minority um, who can take an overseas trip. Uh, you know, um, so, so much bigger than 20 years ago, but still uh, a, small, a small number, right? Um, I, I think, uh, Today, yes, you know, um, the trend is not very uh, encouraging uh, from a political point of view, um, but I think individually, um, you know, I think uh, I, I'm still believing it. Um, you know, as I said, you know, I, I live in the US for 12 years, you know, I, I, I have uh, really no bad thing to say about it. And, you know, I had a great, great experience, just like um, 
what Travis Dan said about their experience in China. You know, I live in Shanghai now um, for, um, for, for 11, almost uh, 11 years, you know, a little bit less than what I live in the US. Um, but, but, you know, my US experience made me also uh, appreciate my Chinese culture even more, right? Um, and, and, you know, you find yourself uh, understand what you used to um, not to, you know, sort of understand that well about China, you know, forget about US. Right. So because you have that contrast, you have that different set of eyes and, and different angle and you appreciate it more. Um, you know, of course, you appreciate the U.S. Uh, culture, too. And, and these are two countries, um, in a way, um, you know, I, I personally have a travel experience with other countries, but living experience, I only have uh, experience in these two countries and they are the most uh, the biggest two countries. Um, certainly the spotlight of the world stage, but, uh, um, you know, I think we should all do more to encourage that, that exchange and, and uh, continue to continue. Thank you, Fung. Thank you. That's, that's, that's very, uh, very helpful. Um, Travis, I, I, do you have anything to, to add to what uh, Fung was saying about um, this, this way in which uh, in both countries, honestly, uh, perceptions of the other are of the most dramatic things, the scariest things, not necessarily of the most typical uh, or representative things. And that may just be about the news or social media or things like that. But I'm, I'm curious if you have, have thoughts about that having gone in the opposite direction from, from US to China. Yeah, absolutely. A great question and really appreciated you know, Gufeng's re remarks, um, you know, my, my facetious kind of response would be what risks, right? You ask, what are the risks? I'd say, what risks? Um, and I'm being dramatic, right? Because there are very much authentic challenges that were touched on, right? Related to travel or health concerns. And of course, bad things happen to students in both countries. And that's, that's all real and, and understand why parents, you know, and, and administrators and others have to worry about that and, and put in place risk mitigation. But that would happen in regardless, right? It can happen if you don't study abroad, you're still facing risks. So I really would say what risks? I believe today there's been no more important time for young people to study abroad in each other's countries than today. Um, you know, we need more than ever students moving back and forth. We need to increase people to people contact between our two countries, right? The US-China relationship um, has become and continues to evolve into the most consequential in the world. And I know a lot of folks on this call hear that a lot, but I, I truly believe that. It may, may sound dramatic, but you know, the future of humanity does de depend on the people in both of these, in these two nations figuring out how to understand each other, how to communicate with each other, and how to collaborate with each other. Uh, so we need young people, right, to do this, to take this leap and to study abroad and, and make a difference in the world, right? The global challenges that our children and grandchildren will face around you know, nuclear weapons proliferation and climate change and transnational crime, et cetera, et cetera, require, you know, individuals to have deep um, understanding and relationships in the other country. So, you know, and, you know, in my very humble opinion, you know, to be successful in the world, this next generation, which again, I have kids like you, Gafung, that are part of that, they need to have a global perspective, don't they? Um, you're not going to be successful unless you do. And I'm trying to understand, for example, while, why gas prices in the United States are increasing without a broader perspective of the world, good luck, right? You're gonna have a very difficult time understanding what's going on around you. So again, I mentioned this before, but that perspective and exposure to different ideas is really the essence of living, right? It's the, the difference of like, it's easy to debate or dispute someone in the comment section of a Weibo post or a YouTube clip. It's something very different to sit down at a table, knee to knee with a coffee in hand and look across at someone from a different country that has a very different view than you do on an issue and listen to them and try to understand their perspective and then to articulate your own position, right? That's how you learn. That's how you really develop the kinds of uh, kind of core competencies that you'll need to be successful in this very kind of global world in which we live in. So yes, there are risks, but boy, does I think the benefits you know, outweigh the risks. Dan, you have thoughts on this? Boy, I have so many thoughts on this, but Travis and Fung just kind of 
took a lot of what I was thinking about anyway. So, but I'll, I'll probably kind of add on to a few of their comments. And, you know, Jeff, I was reflecting a little bit um, when you and I were together in DC in, in December, and we talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, honestly, what I've seen in the breakdown of the, the relationship between our countries, frankly, breaks my heart and it scares me. Um, and if I think back to, well, a couple of things that I'll, I'll, I'll mention. First of all, if I think back to when I had the opportunity to, to do this, um, it was remarkable because I, I think that we lived in a time when just the student exchange helped improve the understanding between our countries. It found the commonalities rather than the differences. Um, when it did find differences, it found it as an opportunity to, to, to bring understanding rather than you know, scare. And I guess the last couple of years when we've seen the relationship go the opposite direction, break down, and you know, because of the pandemic, it's been hard to get people in uh, either way. Um, understanding breaks down, you know, and, and if you think about just even the most obvious example, um, you know, not having reporters from each other's countries in country, you're not going to get very good understanding. You're going to get kind of third and fourth party information filtered on, on what's really happening. And it just, it, it, it doesn't do well for, you know, bringing people together. So I, I, I guess my, my initial reaction is, if there was one thing that we could fundamentally do different to make things better between our countries, it would be to escalate the number of student exchanges and, and really focus on this point and, and you know, encourage it. And I, you know, I'll tell you, uh, one of my assistants, her son is about ready to graduate from, college, or from high school, super smart kid. And uh, she was asking me about, you know, uh, all these universities in, in, in the UK. And I thought, well, okay, I don't know a lot about the UK, but I'll, I'll try to help you out. And, uh, but I said, you know, if this kid's so smart, why isn't he applying to like Columbia and Harvard and Yale? I mean, cause he's like super smart in chemistry. And she goes, oh, he doesn't want to go to the States. He's afraid of the States. And I said, I, I, I was blown away. And you, you had told me similar things to that. And it just, it broke my heart. I was thinking, oh my God. You know, we really got to, to correct this because, you know, directionally, it's not good. Um, so, yes, uh, certainly there are risks. It might be personal. It might be political. Um, but I think we also need to, to take the approach to prepare people better going in so that they understand, you know, I mean, honestly, um, my kids grew up in China and they respect the law. And they respect the they respect the way that things should be done, um, and I think to to you know before kids go to the U.S. or before you know foreign kids come to China, it, it's also you know appropriate to prepare them correctly so that they make good decisions. And I guess um, you know the experience will help you make better decisions. But I think as you as you evolve from kind of your whatever it is from your adolescence into your, your more adult years. It's really how you make decisions that's going to guide, uh, you know, how you evolve. And, uh, you know, for me, I think the experience that you're going to get through this overseas, you know, and, and not only the experience that you're going to get as an individual, but the opportunity that you can give back to the broader society is, is fantastic. And that's something that we also fail to, to think about. We only think about the individual. We don't think about the broader impact on society. So not sure if that uh, helps, but uh, these are some of the things that are on my mind. Thank you, Dan. Yes, that, 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 that helps a great deal. Uh, Jane, further thoughts on this topic? Yes, um, I definitely believe uh, life is very short. Uh, we ought to bring our children to an extent we can. Uh, to see the different sides of the world. Uh, we not only take our children to USA, Europe, these developed countries, but also in the poor village in Africa, the refugee camps uh, near the border of Syria, uh, when they saw uh, the kids who suffer so much because of the war, they have different appreciation uh, for their lives. 
Uh, and I, no matter where we go, I think we see very similar topics uh, being discussed by the people around the world. Um, most people care about the education for their young children, care about the career path for their young uh, generation, and care about uh, peace for uh, life for their family. Uh, so rather than seeing uh, lots of differences, we also uh, can maximize our shared interest. Uh, so a story I would like to share uh, to close out is that uh, my older daughter goes to UWC and over there, kids are very encouraged uh, to share their experience, uh, their culture and their beliefs. And normally after the bonding session, uh, kids who attend new school become very good friends. And uh, there is one exception. Uh, these two kids, just after the bonding, they still don't feel comfortable uh, talking with each other. Uh, one kid was from Israel, one kid was from Palestine, uh, because they, the older generation portrayed each other as evil. Uh, so uh, the school really did a very good job bringing kids together. So after one year of living together, studying together, these two kids become lifetime friends. And I want to see more children, uh, more people from different cultures, from different nations become friends. Uh, so we are putting lots of efforts uh, to invite uh, people from uh, all over the world after the pandemic is over. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to receive more foreign uh, students to come and visit China and also to bring more kids to see the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, th thank, thank you to all of you. And if I if I were to sort of uh, distill uh, a, a single message, which actually is very helpful to me when I have these conversations, uh, I hear all of you saying, you know, don't pretend that that there's uh, no risk uh, in in traveling or or trying new things or or, or, or doing things. Um, the 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 message rather is to say. Uh, look, uh, life is about uh, always a combination of uh, taking prudent risks and realizing the benefits that come from having taken those risks. And all four of you have really spelled out a, a, a broad and deep portfolio of benefits um, that, that await those who, 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 who do this, who step out of their comfort zones. Um, and that won't be available if you if if you hide, if you if you if you refuse to to to, to go out like that. That that that's um, very very helpful and an encouraging um, message. Um, uh, well, before we open the floor uh, to questions uh, from the audience, and again, uh, anyone who in the audience who uh, would like to ask a question, uh, please click on the Q and A button. Uh, at the bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, but before we do that, um, I just uh, I want to throw things open a little bit. The, the four of you um, didn't really know each other before we, we did this webinar, and yet you were all uh, active in this world of, of ocean crossing uh, during roughly uh, the same, same period. So I, I, maybe uh, instead of my uh, controlling this, let me just throw things open to the four of you and say, do you have any questions for each other um, that that uh, you think our, our audience might find interesting? Um, maybe I can start. Uh, in the 14th uh, five-year plan, China has put efforts uh, to make attracting the foreign friends to visit China as one of the priority uh, for uh, China. And I love to hear from Dan and Travis as to the things, maybe top two things China can improve in order to make travel into China much easier. Well, I can, I can start. I think the <laughs> obviously the first thing is gonna be, uh, we gotta make travel easier. We gotta get flights back to between the countries, make it make it more regular. Um, honestly, I went through the experience uh, coming back in late January, and for somebody that I, I've, I've probably been out, in and out of China, I don't know, three or four hundred times in my life, um, no joke. 
this was the only time I was actually really nervous about coming back um, because just navigating all the health codes, all the PCR tests, all the requirements, it's all for the right reasons. Um, and then to, to arrive and go through all the quarantine stuff, you know, it just, it makes people really think long and hard about whether or not it makes sense to even go back, uh, go back to your home country, but also then to come back to China. So I think certainly we've got to get to the point where we're comfortable from a uh, public health perspective that we can start to move things forward. Um, that would be one, you know, clearly um, getting, you know, processing visas is important. Um, you know, from a, from a corporate perspective, I have to tell you, um, the pandemic has probably been, I hate to say this, I, I know it's being recorded, but I'm going to say it and it's going to be misinterpreted. The pandemic has actually probably been somewhat good from our business perspective because we don't have all the foreign executives coming in and out because it can be quite distracting. It's, it's, it's forced us to be uh, much more self-sustaining, I guess. But I think it's time now that, you know, it's been closed for a couple of years. We've got to, we've got to start to reopen the door and, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, companies like Novartis or, or Jahwe or, you know, whoever it's going to be, I think we all have a way to contribute to uh, helping the government get comfortable with that. But, you know, clearly that's, that's where I think we need to go. Thank, Thank you, you, Dan. Dan. Travis, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, well, I'd first of all, just affirm everything um, Dan just said. J Jane, it's a great question, but, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement, um, right? We're, we're, we're at a very low level of where, you know, we have very few people coming from the U.S. into China where there's a lot of pent up demand. Um, so it's, it's flights, it's visas, it's, you know, facilitating all of that experiment. It's almost impossible. How many, I mean, how many American students are currently studying abroad in China today? Um, Jeff, you may actually know the, the exact number, but I think it's actually countable on a, on a, between this group on our hands, we could, we could count them all, I think. So it's we, a bit, we, 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 we've got a few hundred, but we're very, very fortunate, so. <laughs> Yeah, so right, we're we're in the hundreds. Um, unfortunately, that chart, yeah, that's that's really low on the chart where that you showed earlier and where we want to get to. So just facilitating that one one just kind of maybe humorous or anecdotal um, item to think about as we've transitioned into kind of everything happening through our mobile phones in China these last four or five years. Right, I pay for everything on there. My my Jian Kong Baoza. Imagine a tourist now coming into China that doesn't have a Chinese bank account and a Chinese phone number. How does that individual now navigate China? How do you book a ticket? How do you book a hotel room? How, how do you use trip.com, right? I mean, trip.com I think is one exception, but everything else almost entirely, you have to be able to access through your, your Chinese kind of ecosystem of apps. So that's one to think about. Mm -hmm. um, can you. I propose the counter question then in, in response, Jane? I love that you went first. I wanted to ask, I was so impressed, uh, Jane and, and Dan and Fung with the comments that you made and, Kind of the proponents that you are for study abroad and the experiences that you've had i'm just thinking you know for those of us that have been fortunate enough and fung used the word privileged right that we've all been privileged to have that opportunity i think that's the right word you know what have you done or what have you found effective in how you've interacted with others to promote others to have this experience how have you been successful in encouraging other americans or other chinese young people to study abroad like what can we do as you know, believers in the cause, how do we now go out and kind of propagate and, and, and promote that to others? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, um, um, Travis, I can start with that. I, I, I actually would say, other than what, uh, um, what, what um, um, uh, uh, Jeff uh, summarized, I think another key message other than perspective broaden, I think we all have to believe in the goodness of a people. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Chinese or American. If you like what the Jane told the story of their class, her, her daughter's classmates, um, you know, people tend to have this uh, facade, but you know, deep down, it doesn't matter. Your high life, you know, whatever, you know, all we worry about is food on the table, kids are safe, go to school, right? You know, get work done, don't yell at my boss, so, you know, whatever, right? So um, it's, you know, vast majority of us, though it doesn't matter as Americans, you travel to other countries, you, you travel to Africa, Arab, you know, most people 
uh, good. Um, and, and, and that's the most important part we have to spread, you know, um, and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you got, get to know people, um, you will see, you know, they are just like us. Um, and, and as I said, yes, of course, there's bad apples everywhere. That's uh, probabilistic, right? Um, but, but most people just like us. Um, and, and uh, I mean, that's, that's the most, uh, that's the most important part, you know, um, we're in a healthcare business. Um, and, and, you know, today, uh, I have quite a few doctors um, are backed up. They can come in. Um, you know, even um, we have a visa, you know, the, the, the problem, even you have a visa, you know, the, the, the cold never become green, <laughs> you know, they can't board the plane or the plane is canceled, right? Um, and uh, so, so I think uh, the, um, the uh, going the other way, I, I think is, is also, um, um, it's difficult, even though it's getting easier. But uh, but again, you know, and again, as uh, you know, from China side, I always tell people, you know, um, you know, part of our education always uh, has is a bit of a, a lacking that uh, regard is to really have appreciation of uh, human as a human, you know, individual as a human. You know, I mean, they're no different um, from us. We may speak different language, we may look differently. But deep down, we are the same, you know, uh, we want the similar things. Thank you. Thank you, Fong. That's great. Um, I see we, we, we do have a couple of questions from the audience, and I, I would really like to be able to, uh, to, to get to them. Um, uh, first one uh, uh, says, uh, when I was growing up, it seemed like the US and China we're heading towards convergence so that future generations would have a common set of international experiences. Today, it seems like the US and China are increasingly keeping each other at arm's length in economics, in technology, and even in dialogue. Where do you see the US-China relationship in 2024 uh, or in 2030? Who'd like to to take a bite of that one. I'm, I'm happy to start. Great, thank you. Uh, this is something that I think about almost on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, as, I, as I've said before, uh, where we've arrived at in recent years troubles me quite a bit. Um, and I have to say, I feel like uh, several, several years ago when this when the trade war started to kind of evolve um, unfortunately i think that was a sign that there was quite a bit of misunderstanding within the relationship already and you know when you start doing this tit for tat thing um, unfortunately it becomes personal and once something became personal i think it really starts to break the trust and i think the U.S. side, in my in my view, um, failed to understand how how important bond and trust is within Chinese culture, and once that was broken, um, I think this relationship was headed for a very very bad position. When we were together in in December in Washington D.C., I can tell you the. Um, I was quite disturbed. I had worked in DC for many, many years as a lawyer up at the US Senate. And um, I'd never seen uh, such negativity, frankly. Um, and that really troubled me. And I guess the, the thing that concerned me, frankly, you asked about 2024. What's interesting about 2024 from a US perspective is that's the next round of presidential elections. Um, and right now, you even have it mid-year. Uh, you got the midterms coming up. You know, there really isn't a lot of people that have the, the stomach, if you will, or the courage to say what's good about the relationship and why we should be focusing on this is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, and if we have people that are only playing to their own constituencies to, uh, to try to get votes or whatever it's going to be, and I know that happens in, in this system as well, um, it's not good. But I also think that maybe 
some of the geopolitical issues that are happening right now, maybe you're going to give us a, a, an opportunity for pause where people say, you know what, actually, maybe the countries need to come together and really play a positive role together to start to rectify some of the things that are getting off the rails, whether it's the pandemic, it's Ukraine and Russia, you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, so I, I, I actually, strangely enough, I kind of feel like, you know what, maybe this is the, the opportunity that we need to kind of get the countries back together toward working at that trust. And if we can do that, then by the time we hit 2030, I think we're going to be in a good situation. But uh, anyway, that's just my view. I'm an optimist. So, 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 so maybe uh, the, the optimistic uh, perspective is uh, things had to get to a, a certain low point uh, before they could start to bounce back or the, the pendulum had to swing uh, to an extreme enough position uh, before gravity would start to start to pull it back uh, towards the Unfortunately, center. some of the players have changed. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, anyone else have anything to add to this uh, question about uh, the the larger context of US China? Travis? Sure. Yeah, I think Dan's comments were, were spot on. And I keep thinking about the point he made previously about kind of the breakdown of trust and the, the tensions in the bilateral relationship. And one way to counter that is through what the topic of the day is, right, is, is that people to people exchange and how do we increase that? Um, I'm also an optimist, but I might add one additional layer on to, to Dan's point. You know, as the pendulum has swung in, in, a, in a relatively negative direction, my sense is it's not going to swing all the way back to where it was, but maybe swing back, but in a different direction, right? So, um, you know, fast forward 2024, 2030, what have you, my sense is there'll be more fragmentation in the bilateral relationship, right? Where spaces like technology, right? The Jeffrey who asked the question mentions technology and economics, right? That's probably an area for a while there will be, uh, you know, some disharmony or some fragmentation or, or non-alignment. But I think like Dan said, there is a realization, this, the bilateral relationship means both the US and China benefit, right? Both countries benefit from a robust economic uh, partnership, whether we like to admit that at the political level or not, there is a lot of benefit that comes to both countries through our, our economic ties. And if we go so far off the rails that we start to feel that pinch, I do think we have pragmatic decision makers, hopefully, in, in, in positions that will recognize that and make those decisions that are pragmatic, right? Because from a pragmatic perspective, finding ways to align, finding ways to um, identify where mutual benefit exists, um, and then working towards those goals benefits the people of both nations. And so I, I too hope we'll, we'll swing back, that pendulum will, will swing back. I just don't know that it will go all the way back to where maybe it was at the kind of origin of the question Jeffrey mentioned. But uh, so there may be some fragmentation, I think, that will spill over for some time and we'll continue to have contentious elements in the bilateral, but there will be areas where we'll find kind of practical solutions and ways to collaborate. Can I just uh, push just a, a, a little bit on this? Um, because I, I, I think uh, Dan mentioned we were in Washington uh, with uh, the American Chamber of Commerce uh, of Shanghai in December. And we were uh, talking with people and um, uh, what we were hearing everywhere was that the, the era of engagement uh, which is now the way um, what we would think of as normal times are described. Uh, the era of engagement is is over, or it's 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 badly weakened, and uh, and we felt um, that uh, you know it was our responsibility to try to uh, articulate the burdens of the the benefits of engagement. Um, uh, in a way that we never used to have to, because people, everybody just saw them everywhere. And, and people saw, oh, these are the two most important countries in the world. And, and when they work together at a people to people level or country to country level, um, there are huge benefits for everyone. And it seemed uh, self-evident. Uh, suddenly we were being asked to articulate uh, the benefits of engagement. And I, I, I'm just, you know, as, as, as you were speaking, Travis, I, I, I sort of felt like, you find those uh, to some extent self-evident. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if, if you can think of a strategy for how 
uh, people like us who have lived in both countries and seen it um, can show those benefits of engagement to people in both countries who haven't crossed the ocean. Um, because now I think um, in, in, in both countries, we are sort of suddenly sensing this, this questioning of those benefits and, and, and how can we reach those audiences? And maybe, maybe Jane, you're, you're, you're often interacting with, with people uh, who, who haven't crossed over and you're, you're, you're telling the story. Any suggestions mm -hmm. on that? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think uh, Chinese people so far, if you look at the outbound travel, still outweighs the inbound travel. Uh, so maybe it's benefited from Confucian's teaching. Um, it is better to travel 10,000 miles than to read 10,000 books. So uh, in our mind, uh, traveling is learning. So it's part of the learning process. Um, now, inbound, when we look at our numbers, uh, the majority of the OECD countries, uh, one to three percent of the GDP growth comes from inbound travel. So they have done a very good job of promoting their country as a destination. Um, in, among all these countries, uh, outside of OECD countries, Thailand uh, is the best. 12% uh, of their GDP is from inbound travel. In Japan, Singapore does a very good job as well. Five to 7% of the GDP are coming from inbound travel. So China really uh, has a very good opportunity uh, if we only catch up with the OECD country to raise the GDP income uh, to about one to 3%. Uh, that alone can attract lots of customers. And that's the best promotion uh, for China, for people to eliminate or reduce the misunderstanding of China. So I'm very committed to, with our team uh, to make sure that uh, we do as much as possible, whether through business travel, through uh, leisure travel, through student exchange, uh, through anything, uh, online uh, communication, to really encourage an open communication among these two nations. Because I strongly believe that people from these two nations share so much common interest. We have to do everything we can to maximize our shared interest. Only then we can reduce the misunderstanding and promote international exchange and promote global peace. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And that does uh, tie back into what uh, Dan and Travis were saying earlier about the importance of, of trying to find a way to reopen the borders so that it's easier for people uh, to get yeah. into China uh, right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question and, and uh, from the audience, and I'll, I'll point it to, to Fung if I may. Um, what, what preparation would you suggest uh, that young people make before they decide to study abroad. Any, any, any common kinds of preparation for both Chinese uh, and American students? Any different uh, kind of education for uh, Chinese students going to the US and American students uh, coming to China? Yeah, I think the, uh, first of all, um, these days, uh, when you study to the US, uh, in the US, um, it's much different now, right? I think, uh, you know, like I said, you know, the, when I went to the US, uh, that was the first time I flew, right? I mean, like, uh, you know, take a, take a flight. Um, you know, you, you, the good thing is you don't know much to expect, right? So your expectation is quite low. But today, I guess the young kids uh, go to the US or the other way around. Um, it won't be that shock because as I said, as long as you, you expose, if you can travel, you know, you have a, the summer camp before you uh, tend to, uh, before you go to the, um, the, the, the college, right? Now, I, I think in general, um, again, you know, speaking not just as a, as a old timer, so to speak, but as a parent, you know, I would say, you know, it's really about prepare other than, you know, travel, if you have the means um, before that. Um, the second thing is really, prepare the mentality, right? I mean, as I said, you can't prepare yourself uh, going to the um, a country like US or China, you know, you have to enjoy the ride, you know, and, 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 and you know, there's no such a thing you can prepare your life, right? <laughs> prepare you for life, you have to live it, you know, you can't, you can't really prepare it. Um, you know, that's something I would, uh, 
you know, I, I mean, underline my thinking. I think it's 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 um, it's all part of the experience, right? You know, um, again, if you can see a different world, I mean, how great that is, right? Um, and and you know, having some surprise are the benefits um, uh, of taking a new experience. So so I, I, you know, all I'm trying to say is it's not as bad as you think. It may not be as good as you think. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so just go enjoy it, you know, uh, it's better than, you know, when you're getting like, you know, for example, I always tell people, you know, I'm in the business of healthcare. I, you know, I opened a hospital in China, um, because I believe, uh, when you do, um, healthcare is very, very different, um, uh, from studying over overseas, right? When you study overseas, you're 20, you know, you want to leave home, you want to fly, you want to freedom. You know, you're 70, you know, somebody has cancer. That's very different. You want to stay at home. You know, you want to stay close to your uh, families. You know, you don't want to travel um, overseas because it's very different stage of life, right? So, so, you know, I would encourage all the young people, if you, again, you know, uh, just be, um, be mindful that's still a privilege. Not everyone can, can have that opportunity on um, trying to enjoy it. Thank you, Feng. Thank you. Anyone else have uh, advice for uh, uh, potential students uh, who are, are willing to, to take this step? Jane. <laughs> yes, I, I, as a mother, I understand a lot of uh, parents always uh, want to uh, make sure their kids are very well taken care of and have uh, supports when they need it. Uh, I would encourage students to do a couple of things. One is polish your language skill uh, where, uh, wherever you go. Uh, if you go to a Spanish speaking country, obviously uh, learning some language will make life much easier. Uh, secondly, also read some literature about that country, read some history about that country will make it much more rewarding. And thirdly, if it's all possible, try to build uh, some network before you, you even go there. Uh, so make some friends. Uh, so when you arrive in a foreign country, uh, you have somebody already, uh, can you show you around, uh, make sure your trip is pleasant and also safe. Uh, I think these are the things we can do. Now, I see lots of students, lots of colleges already have uh, events uh, uh, in the uh, country where they, the students are, uh, try to get them uh, familiarized uh, with the environment they will be in. Uh, but again, uh, life is an adventure. I think if you go there, enjoy yourself. Don't eat Chinese food. You know, eat as many different food as possible. Uh, Chinese food is one kind of cuisine. Uh, try to watch some uh, sports, uh, play some sports as a local kids does. Uh, watch some uh, local uh, shows, movies, uh, embrace yourself into uh, the local environment because uh, this is life. Uh, I'm sure uh, wherever you go, try to uh, learn as much as possible uh, from the local community will make your life colorful. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, our, our, our time is is winding down. And I, uh, if I may, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of reactions to the comments uh, from our speakers. And uh, it's fascinating to me, I must say, um, how uh, similarly uh, the four of you uh, think about this, uh, think about your experience, uh, think about the advice uh, you give. I think uh, part of the message that I, I wasn't quite expecting when we planned this um, but that's very powerful and that I appreciate uh, myself uh, was the way in which all of you are, are, are telling uh, young people who are thinking of going overseas uh, to not worry about being surprised, uh, but the opposite, uh, to embrace the surprise, to, to understand that the, the whole point of this uh, is to go on a journey um, that is not what you're planning. Uh, and that is uh, part of the great benefit um, that you'll take away from it. Um, and it's part of the joy uh, of the 
of the experience uh, that you will will have. And I, I would just say for myself, um, Chancellor Tong mentioned at the beginning, I, I did not study in China. Uh, I studied away in France. Um, but my study away experience uh, was very similar to the one uh, that the four of you uh, described. Um, it gave me an entirely different uh, perspective on my own country uh, than I had before. Um, in some ways, it deepened my appreciation uh, for my own country. Uh, in other ways, uh, it, it gave me a whole new worldview um, that I was so grateful uh, to have uh, had had the opportunity to acquire. Uh, and I, I, I felt uh, that I was uh, no longer um, limited to one set of eyes. I, I had multiple sets of eyes. Um, I, I, I was really expanded uh, from, uh, from the experience. And, and that I think uh, for, for each of the four of you uh, was also um, uh, a key part uh, of the experience. And then the other thing that all of you emphasized uh, is the, the way in which uh, a study away experience uh, gives you a, a completely different appreciation for uh, the, the shared humanity um, that, that's, that, that spans the globe. Uh, the, all the things, all the ways in which people who grow up uh, in different cultures uh, are the same. They may express uh, common uh, values, common ideals, common perspectives differently. Um, but uh, at their, in, you know, in the center of their hearts, um, uh, they, are, they are the same. And that is also a great uh, experience. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank all, all four of you uh, for uh, taking time out of your very, very busy lives uh, to join us uh, in this adventure. And I'll hand the screen now back to Chancellor Tong. You're 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 on mute, Chancellor Tong. There you go. It, it works now. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, for the wonderful talk. And uh, I I I think uh, some of our uh, audience already told me that uh, they uh, like the talk very much and that they benefit from the uh, <clears throat> uh, contributions from you. And uh, I myself also uh, spent uh, uh, quite several years uh, abroad, uh, several years in Norway, half a year in Germany. And I was uh, invited to actually by the uh, State uh, Department of State actually uh, uh, in 1996 uh, to spend the whole su summer vacation uh, to attend a summer seminar <clears throat> uh, sponsored by uh, a uh, National Endowment of uh, Humanities and then I spent one year as a Fulbright scholar uh, in New York yeah, at Columbia University. And I really uh, benefit a lot uh, from uh, my stay uh, abroad, uh, particularly in the United States. And uh, also looking back to that period, I benefited a lot from the best period period of the uh, uh, Sino-American relationship. So uh, maybe it's difficult for us to go back to that period, but uh, I think probably we can, uh, 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 I mean, this uh, difficult period, we can even have uh, an optimistic understanding because uh, uh, in my view, uh, you know, Chinese people and American people and Chinese people and uh, people from the Western countries, uh, nowadays uh, treat each other uh, more equally because they uh, have expectation for the other side uh, 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 more highly uh, than uh, it used to be. So when you ex you have a higher expectation, you can uh, have uh, you know more reasons to complain, more re more, more reasons uh, you know to criticize. So uh, hopefully we can uh, go through this uh, uh, stage and uh, uh, to uh, find a better way uh, you know to uh, communicate with each other. So <clears throat> uh, that's. Uh, uh, 
uh, my uh, uh, reaction. And thank you very much uh, on my uh, on uh, on behalf of myself also because I learned a lot. And uh, what you have uh, shared with us uh, will also be very important for my job here at NY Shanghai. Okay, so it's time for uh, for us to say uh, goodbye to each other. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah, bye. You. Thanks. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye